Hi, everyone. Welcome to a Friday afternoon New Zealand Initiative webinar for our members. We haven't done too many of these, but it's great to open the year on this, at least for me, with Leon Grice. Uh, we've been really worried about the border system for rather some time. Members might recall um, policy papers that we put out last year. We started off in March with some early hits on how COVID response should be looking, uh, some of the economic response to it, as well as starting to think about better border systems. We had another paper that came out in July on better border systems around improving safety so that once you have a safer system, more people can come through. We were hearing a lot from our members about rub points they were hitting and getting essential workers through and the chaos that's caused when you can't get people who are critically important into the country in any reasonable time frame. Personally, all of my family and all of my in-laws are abroad. I would love for them to be able to come through and I have a mild terror of that an emergency could strike anytime and there's effectively no way of getting to them because you can't come home. Scaling up the border is the only way of addressing these kinds of concerns. 1.2 million Kiwis were born abroad and are in the same spot as me. Uh, up to a million Kiwis live abroad and could have to come back here uh, at any time. Our border system is not up for it. The only way of safely scaling up operations at the border in our view has been getting a lot better testing method in that if you catch cases as they emerge and get them out to jet park, you de-risk the system and enable it to scale up. Similarly, if you can push some of the testing abroad to stop people from coming in while infected, that also allows scaling up. Here at home though, it's been frustrating. Initially in August, the government was saying, well, testing of the workers in the system, not all that important. It's kind of unkind to force a stick up everybody's nose to force them to be tested. They came around on that. But at the same time as Minister Hipkins was saying this in August, the University of Illinois had come up with a beautiful new testing system designed around saliva collection rather than nasopharyngeal swabs. They ended up proving at least as effective as the nasal swabs. They're still a PCR test, but they're far more rapid and they're cheaper. They're less invasive. And all of that means that you can build a system around really regular testing. And that's something that economists who watch uh, COVID and COVID response have been pushing since this has really been getting going. Josh Gans's newsletter is really very good if you're into that sort of thing. With me now is Leon Grice at Reiko Science, and they are now delivering the Illinois Shield system here in New Zealand for a few private companies that have contracted with them for fairly regular COVID testing of their staff to help ensure health and safety for their workers. Getting this working on the ground is really important. If you get our the New Zealand Initiatives newsletter, I argued there that um, some of the government's responses seemed as though they want to pretend that things going on overseas are impossible here or that there's some reason not to do things. It's harder to say that something is impossible when it's already working on the ground. And I'm delighted that Leon's here to walk us through how he got this going on the ground, how the system works, what collection is like. And I think there's a few reasons that this matters. For you as our members, who are some New Zealand's major employers, knowing that there's a system available if you need it to be able to get testing for your own workforce, you can imagine better policy down the track that would have perhaps more liberal rules under uh, a COVID outbreak for employers that had regular testing for all of their workers to maintain safety. That's one of the kinds of things that we'll be talking about in later work on bo better border systems. But also for us from a policy perspective, getting a policy of daily testing for every single person in the entire border system and who is sitting in MIQ can enable a far safer system, which enables scaling up, which enables a more normal sort of border relation. So I'm gonna shut up. We'll hear from Leon about what he's been up to. He's a hero, this is awesome. It's great that this is now in place and I want all of you to know about it. So take it away. Oh, well, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a hero. The heroes are a collection of people because I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian, but I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a very smart um, brother and nephews and, um, and, and kids. So uh, it started because in, in, uh, when my brother, Stephen, uh, who's a couple of years younger than, than me, was at in the 17 years old, he was um, top of his class in maths. And a fellow called Richard Logerson um, was age 15, was put up to the seventh form and Stephen went from being the best in class to being having his clock cleaned 
by Richard Logerson, and he says he hated it. But they became lifelong friends. And Richard went on to Canterbury University. And then uh, he's, he's uh, I think he's been head of mathematics at University of Illinois. And Stephen uh, did a PhD in, in um, quantum mechanics uh, and um, at Canterbury University. So they've been lifelong friends. Stephen's son, my nephew Patrick, um, had an insight into the what are called the SIR equations and worked out that you could use calculus to calculate the uh, uh, reproduction number on a daily basis in every region in the world. And so Stephen took that to his old friend Richard mm -hmm. and says, I think that um, Patrick's got something. So they went and did that and worked on it. And you can see it on covid19.closeassociate.com and it's free for everybody. It's public domain, the research, the math papers in the, in the public domain. But after um, that project, was coming to a conclusion, uh, Richard said, we're about to deploy the saliva test. And we thought, that's very interesting. And we just followed it uh, through July and August when they started testing and could see that immediately that, um, what they have is a 46,000 person campus in Urbana. And it's surrounded by cornfields, so it's like an island. And uh, they knew that at the beginning of the academic year, which is early August in the United States, they were going to end up with COVID coming into that campus and they, were, and they modeled it and realized they were going to have to shut down. So they, they needed something to actually uh, take the positive cases out of the population, rapid isolation, so they could keep the campus open. So they deployed the saliva test and they were, they were getting 10,000 tests a day, which we were mm -hmm. really impressed with that productivity. Uh, and then over time, we realized that actually they um, th they'd come up with something. And we read the public domain papers about um, how they'd come up with a new protocol, uh, which uh, it lends itself to scalability, scalability um, but it also um, is extremely accurate. Um, and uh, we didn't expect it to be as accurate as it was. We thought that frequency would solve the problem of less accurate than nasal pharyngeal. But when we validated it and we started comparing that to the result, it validated here in New Zealand, uh, we were really uh, excited at the fact that it comes through as, as accurate as a nasal swab. Um, and, uh, and that's a bit of a game changer for, you know, I think, uh, the, the United States and other places that have, that have got this uh, access to this technology. Mm -hmm. So, um, we licensed it in September. We formed, because Stephen's, um, out of his, uh, uh, lane when it comes to molecular biology and, uh, and health, uh, we went to Arthur Morris, who's a senior pathologist in Auckland, uh, and a very experienced, uh, um, professional. We went to Amanda Dixon McIver at iGens, who's a laboratory director and a specialist in this, these kinds of genetic tests. And then we also uh, uh, recruited, um, well, we didn't recruit because he's independent, uh, Professor uh, Janet Pittman at Victoria University, who was one of, if not the first, one of the first to bring RT-PCR technology to New Zealand. So she's an absolute star in terms of academics. So we had an all-star team. And then we were working with that team. We, we got live, uh, not live, we got paired samples, positive and negative, from the University of Illinois. And that enabled us to actually do a blinded study here in New Zealand at yep. Victoria University and at iGEMS to actually validate the science and then move on to get it accredited. And we achieved that before Christmas. Well, I'll pause you for a second. There are two basic ways of testing this stuff, right? You can get an antigen test. Those tend to be pretty, pretty fast. They're not quite as accurate as PCR. They have a different kind of profile. Uh, they're looking for what happens in the body in reaction. PCR tests are looking for the DNA that comes from the virus itself, right? And often saliva tests get characterized as less accurate because they're thinking about the antigen-based testing. This one, the Illinois Shield Protocol, that's still a PCR test, right? It's absolutely a PCR test. And the, 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 the innovation that they came up with is that once you've collected the sample, the first thing you do is heat it. Um, and in heating the sample, you inactivate the virus so it's no longer infectious. Second thing it does, it actually, uh, if you read the paper, and I'm not a scientist, it breaks open the capsid of the, of the virus and makes the RNA available, which eliminates the need for the RNA extraction step. And the third thing it does is it denatures the enzymes that interfere with the PCR process. So when our samples hit the lab for processing, which has been accredited for this test, um, it's once you've, once you've scanned it in and loaded them into the robot, it just goes straight through, you know, the reagents added automatically, and you've got automation systems and data systems that we've built because our specialty is end-to-end -end data systems. Um, um, we 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 know the identity of the you know of it throughout the whole chain. So all these things that tools that we've been able to apply just give it this fundamental productivity that mm -hmm. allows us to take four machines, two robots, and two PCR machines 
two shifts of two people and we can do 10,000 tests a day. And that's what you're scaled up to currently. Yeah. So who are you delivering this for currently? Um, we've got two customers who have identified themselves in Auckland Airport and in New Zealand. And the other one is uh, it started in Auckland uh, this week. And so our third customer. So we're live with three customers. And considering that we started uh, actually testing in mid-January, it's been, a, it's been a, a good response. So what's the collection process like? So when we, we're used to the swab test, I haven't had one yet, but everybody else in my family has had one. Uh, there it's sort of drive up to a testing station. Somebody puts on a kit of uh, PPE specific for you. Uh, then they stick a stick up your nose and maybe you sneeze, maybe you don't. And it's a little bit unpleasant, but you should do it anyway if you're, if you're risky. Uh, then you wait a couple of days and then eventually your GP calls you up and says, yeah, you can go and have your dentist appointment now because you're clear. Yeah, well, I think the first thing I'd say is that if you've got any symptoms, you should go to the public health system and not yeah. us, right? So you should ring Healthline if you have any symptoms and flu, cold or, or, or COVID-19. So we're, we're only interested in asymptomatic workforce screening um, at, at the moment. And um, the public health system's there for people with symptoms. Absolutely. So I, that, I wanted to get the contrast, right? So yeah, that people yeah, can, yeah, yeah. So, but I have to say yeah. that before I, I do the contrast. So, so we wanted to make it as easy and as quick as possible so people see it as not only painless, but also not a hassle to get through it without queuing. So the first thing is you need to register. We have two-factor authentication, which gives us identity management and chain of custody. And then the, once you've registered, there's a booking slot. And we like people to book in 10 minute um, intervals at an eight drooling station collection site we can we can put people through one a minute and that allows us to that, that what will happen is that they'll book they'll get a qr code before they've arrived they come and, and show their qr code and then we ask a couple of questions to confirm the identity what's your legal name uh, and yep. and what's your um uh, email address and make them read it out um, while they're checking it and then check whether or not they've eaten in the last hour or smoked or vaped or anything that would interfere with the sample type, anything that has an inhibition to the sample. And then uh, once we've gone through those questions, we check a box, it prints out another QR code, which is unique to the person and to the sample that is put, in, put on the vial and they're given a, a teaspoon to drool in so they can tip it into the vial. They go away to a private area where they can turn away and they can drool at their own speed right? So we've got eight of these stations. So it's a, it's a series check-in and a parallel drooling uh, operation. And that gives us productivity to do one at a time. And then once they've completed it and given us one milliliter of drool, which may take two or three, two or three guys, and it's, it's coming from here, the saliva glands that we get the sample from. We don't want anything coming from deep or high. It's got to come from the saliva glands. That's what yep. the sample is. And so, and once they've done that, they put, they put the cap on themselves and they place it themselves into the container and no one touches it. Now, we, the benefit of our collection site um, in terms of, again, productivity is that um, we've trained X air crew um, uh, and uh, fantastic people and they're well-trained, they're really good customer management people. And so they're, re so I'm not, you know, they're not health professionals but our SOPs and all of our quality management systems and the support and the software is, is something that doesn't take long to train them. And we don't need to draw on public health resources or health professionals to be able to do collection. Cool. I see some questions have started coming in on Slido. You'll see a Slido code at the bottom of your screen. It's 30869. If you've got questions, send them through. We'll hear a little bit more from, from uh, Leon here and then I'll start going through the questions that have come through so far. Um, so this is at the a central site, I guess, in Auckland Airport. You'd be serving both Air, both your Air New Zealand and Auckland Airport customers there. If it's at an industrial site, otherwise, how do you manage that? Uh, well, well, we'll tend to set up a collection site wherever we can, and uh, um, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to go mobile, and we have one customer that's designed that up so they can go between different sites. And so they'll manage the, the vehicle and we do everything inside the vehicle for the testing station. Yeah. Um, and um, look, at the end of the day, the, the, uh, we can tend to turn around from the arrival of the lab to the SMS of the result. If it's negative, if it's not negative, then there's a whole public you know, health act uh, uh, process that kicks in. And then our pathologist, okay. uh, our pathologist oversees that process of reporting a positive. In fact, all negatives are 
um, ref, uh, referred to the pathologist as well, and he clears us as a company to send the SMS message telling people that you are negative. Okay. So, so there's all uh, that um, that process that needs to uh, you know happen. So, if you if you can get it to our lab by sort of one o'clock, we'll be set, sending out SMS by five, five, six o'clock. If it comes after then, we'll process them the next morning and be sending them out early afternoon. Now, if the transport time, so for example, let's say uh, there was an operation in Taupo that wanted to be tested regularly, we, we'll be able to return it the next day, but it won't be same day. So it, the, the transport is the, is, the, yeah. is, is the key limiting factor until we establish more labs around the country. Yeah, so conceivably, if something happened and we had an outbreak, like a freezing works would be able to set up a collection point when all the work was going in, to get tested in the morning, and depending how far that is from your operation, they might know by the end of the shift. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. So the first question that I'm going to, okay, looking through the regime, the questions that are coming through here, uh, the first one is asking if there are any countries using the system already. I know that Illinois is already using it on campus, but I don't know whether other countries have adopted it. Well, the other state, University of Wisconsin, which has got 50,000 people on the Madison campus, has is, is adopted it and is starting to deploy it right now. And about a month ago, the Philippines Red Cross started deploying the method. And they've been happy with it so far, presumably? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm look, looking at the other questions that are coming through. That one of them was, are there any companies in New Zealand that have expressed an interest in your test? It, it's our Auckland Airport. And, yeah, we've got three, and, we've got yeah. three customers now and, we're, we're in, um, uh, and another th uh, three uh, conversations um, underway. Excellent. Um, I would love to see this as part of the border system more generally. Um, there's a question that's come through. How responsive was the Ministry of Health to your ideas? I don't know whether you want to get into that at all or not. Oh, we had a big uh, um, a meeting where we shared, we, we've been sharing the data with them. So on the 18th of December, when we had achieved validation and accreditation, our science team wrote to the minister in the ministry and said, we've achieved validation and accreditation and we'd love to brief you. And then, of course, Christmas happened, and then the 15th of January, the discussion, we started the discussions in terms of sharing our uh, information with them. Uh, and we've had another meeting with, this, with them this week, and it was really productive and constructive. Um, and because, uh, you know, the, we are accredited um, to, by IANS, the ISO independent agency, um, to do this test at a medical testing laboratory with the right ISO accreditation. Um, and that's been achieved by IGEMS. And we will look to other laboratories around the country to build that nationwide mm -hmm. network. It's actually not something that's regulated by the Ministry of Health or MedSafe. Yeah. It's, an, it's an in vitro device. And the validation is done by senior pathologists uh, in New Zealand. And so Arthur was able to lead the validation of the test with the support of Janet and Amanda. Yeah. And, uh, and then, then having prepared that science, that was submitted to IAMS who reviewed the work and increased the scope of practice uh, at IGEMS. And of course, you know, our business was set up to provide um, workforce asymptomatic screening and uh, we didn't establish it to, um, uh, um, for, the, for diagnostic testing, even though we, our standard of validation was to diagnosis, we, didn't, we haven't pitched the business to, be, to replace nasal swabs uh, but the question then becomes is if uh, they want more screening and the government's talking about saliva, we're very open to, you know, sharing our knowledge and working with them and finding solutions about getting saliva rolled out around the country. It's pretty neat that you were able to go through an ISO approval process rather than having to seek approval from the Ministry of Health at the outset. Right? It's, it, I can imagine it being a very different kind of world that we'd be in right now or maybe not even having this conversation if... Uh, you'd had to go first to get permission to be able to start anything as opposed to going through an ISO kind of industry certification style approval process. Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't, um, yeah, it was fortunate. We didn't want, we, we um, it certainly makes it a simple, well, it was a very um, a time consuming and hard bit of work that our science team did yeah. to, to get it validated. Um, and, and it was good that the science can stand on its own. Excellent. Um, question has come through. If your test with a daily testing regime had been in place, could we have prevented the recent Auckland lockdown? Um, kind of speculation on other our parts, I guess. Uh, it is speculation. I think, you know, the thing about this, um, and now I'm, I'm going outside of my academic training as an historian, but I have been <laughs> following it closely and am surrounded by scientists. 
And but the you know from the moment of infection to about day three or four, um, you're not going to get any test that'll identify the person is infected. Mm -hmm. um, but the and there is some new science that suggests that the first place in the body that you'll get a, a sample that detects that you have the virus in you is the saliva glands, uh, which is where the aerosols come from that infect people. Um, you know that's the engine room of mm -hmm. moisture that you know no well, sneezes yeah. sneezes can come from higher but in terms of speaking that's where the aerosols come from that could be infecting yeah. like we could be infecting yeah, yeah. each other just by talking and it'd be my saliva aerosols that'll be doing it to you thanks for those <laughs> hopefully they're, they're all good so 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 no one is going to catch it in those first three or four days and then um Typically, what you find with, uh, uh, and by the way, the, the, the ministry deserves tremendous credit to go from a very low base of a 1,500, 2,000 tests a day to 25,000 test capacity yeah. around the country. A lot of DHBs have worked really, really hard. And New Zealand's testing rates are actually comparatively yep. very high in the world. And they needed a lot of credit for help because that infrastructure helped us achieve elimination. Um, and so, you know, all credit um, uh, to them on that. Um, but at the moment, um, and it, it's most likely you're going to get caught when you're starting to show symptoms, which tends to be day six or seven, mm -hmm. right? And so then you're going to, you know, may kid yourself that maybe I'm going to come right and then realize, no, I better go to the doctor. Yep. So about day six, seven, eight is when you're going to go get a nasal swab. And then you're going to have to wait for the result. And if it's fast, it'll be a day. If it's not, it'll be three or four days. And so we're talking about actually you may be recovered by the time mm -hmm. um, you've actually got the nasal swab uh, test. Um, so th that is the they call it the generation time of the of the yeah. virus from um, you know averages. These are all bell curves. There's lots of outliers. So the point is that um, daily testing uh, would catch it in day three, four, or five. And this is the experience in the University of Illinois. Martin Burke, who leads this at University of Illinois, says 90% of the positive cases they capture on ca uh, uh, through their testing uh, infrastructure on campus, 90% are pre-symptomatic. And they've even got a hotel on campus, and so they immediately uh, isolate uh, that person from the population and support them and all that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, the, um, that experience, and that's empirical evidence, you know, suggests that the answer is daily testing will stop this. Yeah, it's hard to imagine how the virus gets in, except through the border system currently. The stories around fomites showing up on freezing freezer stuff, that seems pretty low probability. The, the faster that you can catch anybody in MIQ who's got it, who's come in, the less likely they are to pass it on to a worker in MIQ. And the faster you can catch any of the workers in MIQ who caught it from somebody else in MIQ, the less chance they have of passing it on to a family member. And the more of those kinds of layers that you have, because the daily testing, it isn't just one layer, right? It's a, it's a layer for everybody who's coming in who's potentially infectious. It's a layer for all of the people who are interacting with them in MIQ. And then it's a, that those two layers wind up protecting all the family members for those workers. And it just seems really implausible that you get to a spot where there's somebody in the community who has it, who's a few hops away from the border, and you're stuck trying to figure out, like we were back in August, how the heck something had come through, right? If you've got a process where everybody's tested daily and you've got an audit trail on all of the tests, I don't know how you wind up in a spot that you're three or four infections down the track before you notice anything. I, I don't see how you wind up in another um, lockdown if we have that kind of a system in place. We'll go back to some of the questions. I'll, I'll just quickly sure. quickly add to that. I, I think, you know, the other thing I'd emphasize is that, you know, I, I don't want any of this to imply any criticism of the Ministry of Health and the DHBs because this is actually very new, right? So so the, the work that the University of Illinois was doing, they were entitled to do without any accreditation on their campus, right? Yeah. They had the, the laboratory with the certification to be able to do that. And it's only uh, in the last six weeks before the end of last year that the, that the validation data that they were producing well maybe a little bit long eight eight about beginning in November, december we were starting to see their own scientifically blinded study validation work that then we were able to compare our work with mm -hmm. 
And um, and so really the earliest that the government's heard about it was the, the week before Christmas when everybody was going on holiday. So, so I don't know, Paul Romer was putting up some pretty good data from the Illinois test in the mid November. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but not the validation data. Okay. Not the validation data. What you were getting was incredibly good empirical data. Yeah, not not the the blinded study data. Okay, and okay, the blinded yeah. blinded blinded um, the the blinded um, uh, data um, it's blinded study data. Get my words right. That's that stuff is what actually wins the argument. Yeah. We'll hit hit on some questions here. What is the rate of your false positives and false negatives? <laughs> Um, Janet Pittman did a great um, uh, interview uh, on uh, with Lisa Owen uh, checkpoint, and she was on Morning Report the following morning with Corin Dan. And so I'll send those links to um, uh, to you, Eric, so you can send them out to anybody on yeah. this call. And she she said our test is as accurate as nasal swabs, and if not more accurate in the early stages of infection. Yeah, and she's absolutely definitive about that. So, and Arthur, in terms of the numbers we're looking at, it is, it, it's difficult to say better because, yeah. or, or because each, every test has different strengths and weaknesses. It, 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 and people say that nasal is, um, pharyngeal is a gold standard. That's an, an, an that is an unscientific statement. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a test that is the benchmark because that's what we're doing. It has strengths and weaknesses and we can, and so we're, yeah. comparing ourselves to a system that has strengths and weaknesses, but it's at least as accurate as that system. The way that I envision this kind of thing being rolled out, or if, if I were the one running it, take the, the two nasal swab tests that we've already got for everybody in MIQ, add in a daily saliva test, and then just watch to see what the data shows. If it turns out that the saliva tests are picking people up before the, piece, the uh, nasal swab test does, and the nasal swab test winds up being redundant. Well, you ditch the swab test, stop spending a pile of money on that, and more, more importantly, stop dedicating nursing resource, which is really scarce in the system right now, stop dedicating nursing resource to putting sticks up people's noses and let them redeploy into other more important tasks. Or you find out that you actually need both, in which case you've still improved safety. You've not lost anything, right? It's a bit of an empirical question. Um, in that kind of sense, the rollout can be the test, right? You roll out at scale, you find out how the whole thing is working. You're comparing the daily data that's coming in with what you would already be getting on the swabs and see, what, see what's really needed. I'm going to combine two of the questions that we've got in front of us here. One of them is, what's your daily capacity in New Zealand? And the other one is, if the ministry said we want to have your system, how long would it take to be operational for everyone at the border? Um, the, well, the first um, question um, around the product, our lab has inherent scalability because it's data. It's not, there's nothing manual. Um, so we the number of the that is associated with the qr code uh from uh booking to check-in it remains the same all the way through the system and it's geometrically matched as it changes plates and and mm -hmm. so we just it's just locked down and there's no human error you know yeah. the system that that uh if there's a human error um the whole system will grind to a halt right and so we can go and do corrective action so the data system uh, and the robotics means it's just an inherently scalable solution. Add a PCR machine, we'll add another 5,000 capacity per day, right? So, so we've got two PCR machines and two uh, robots at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, and two shifts of two people can do 10,000. Right? And then you could add a third shift if you wanted. Yeah. But then you're going to have, you know, you know, probably less time, you're going to have to have machines looked after and processed. But, you know, and the, and the two robots and the two PCR machines gives us inherent redundancy. So, but the collection site and establishing it, making sure there's good infection control and that yeah. we've trained the people so that they follow the standard operating procedures. That's the bit that at the moment that we're looking at how do we get better scalability into that? And we're pouring effort and money into quality management systems and training at the moment so that we can spread uh, the load and get more people doing the training. So that would take us at a, at a, at a new company, probably at, we could probably do it at, in, in 10 days, um, right? It, it's yeah. in, in, in a company. Um, my team will hate me for saying saying that. And then the next broader question is, what would it take if we had to turn it on for border workers? Well, that's just a function of collection. 
uh, and if um, uh, we had to do that, uh, we can deploy our software solution, which is crucial to quality mm -hmm. quality control. Uh, but we'd probably look for other methods for um, uh, collection, and we'd need to partner, obviously, with uh, the government to do that. But they haven't asked us, and we're not offering to do that, but we, we stand ready if they want us. Yeah, because your, your focus thus far has been on private, yeah. private company contracting in for it. That's right. Um, question... How much of the quarantine requirements could your test replace? Could you have isolation at home with daily tests? That seems to be kind of an empirical question. Yeah. In yeah. part. Well, you know, there's some work that was done by the Auckland. This is outside my lane and it's outside our company and we're not advocating for it. But Auckland International Airport did do a risk management model looking at, you know, how do you take people like in the Pacific who can come through a green lane? Um, yeah. How do you take people where the infection is going uh, full noise? How do you put them through a red lane and make sure that they never meet each other in the coming through the border? And how do you take somebody who's a, a lower risk? So like a, a month ago, come, people coming out of California would have been high risk. Yep. But if you look at the reproduction rate now in California, it's through the floor. So they've probably still got quite a, a number of daily cases. There'd be volume there. So you could do a risk assessment on that. Maybe that's an orange lane. And then from there, you could, I mean, this is what uh, Auckland Airport's epidemiological risk management proposal and they had scientists work on that um and data analysts and mathematicians work on that risk management model and they they put that out about 10 days two weeks ago and so you know those are the sorts of things and then you can start designing your testing strategy around those risks and you know for me um you have to there isn't anybody who's been in business know that there's no such thing as zero risk in fact if there's zero risk uh you have complete entropy nothing's going on it's a black hole um but so uh, the, we have a system that at the moment, which, which looks, to, you know, to support the elimination um, strategy. But uh, for me, my instincts are, is keep exploring the risk, you know, keep exploring the risk and keep innovating around how you manage that risk. What I like about it is once you've got daily testing, you can see when people show up as in, infected when they're in MIQ, right? So the government has already put in some moves to have pre-flight testing. Um, I think there are some improvements they could make on that, but that's neither here nor there for now. I think it'd be pretty feasible to get some of the rapid an antigen tests right at the gate and have a final test before your board show that you've uh, come up negative on the rapid antigen test. Those are like 15 minute things. Um, add that sort of thing in so that fewer people come in who are infectious. Um, that reduces transmission on the flights, reduces transmission while you're waiting to get into MIQ. You've got, to, you've got to be careful with those antigen tests. You know I mean, because, right. you know, and, and this is absolutely, it's like, you know, the best example of where you've got to be use the right horse for the right course is the Abbott ID now, isn't it? 15 yep. minute test is a good machine and it's very good for determining whether or not you've got influenza or COVID-19 in a clinical setting, which determines yep. what treatment path you're going to have, go on. It's a very important, yep. important decision. And so for $85 a test, I think is what they charge, something like that. For a clinician, it's actually a relatively cheap way of determining what you're going to be doing. Um, the Trump White House was using Abbott ID now for screening and surveillance for people to get into the White House. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened. Yes. So, so you've got to be very careful around the tests. And anti antigen tests on their own uh, um, ha have limited accuracy. I think that gets to the one of the fundamental problems here, right? All of these things are adding on to the current system rather than replacements for. If you had an additional rapid antigen test after the existing ones before you boarded is one more fail safe to stop somebody who's currently infectious from getting on the plane. It wouldn't be a replacement for anything. But if oh, by the way, we are yeah. exploring labs in Sydney and LAX. We'll, we'll get to some discussion about potential <laughs> better border systems out of all of this. But once you've got people then in MIQ, and if you kept people separate, so people coming in from Australia aren't mixing with people coming in from Russia or highly infectious parts of the, of the United States or the UK. If you wound up finding that the protocols abroad in stopping people from boarding while infectious meant that you just didn't see anybody here who turned up positive after, say, day five, like if you ran it and 20,000 people came through, and every single positive case was caught by say day four, day five, and there were no positive cases caught in the next nine days, mm -hmm. then you could start thinking about whether the duration of MIQ should change. But you would, could also find the opposite, right? You could find that you, you are still getting cases at day 11 because there are some people that'll take a long time for it to incubate. 
-hmm. And that's new knowledge too, right? You'd find that out because you'd have the full day by day profile. Yeah. It wouldn't be that the 12, day 12 test is catching somebody who became infected at day six mm. or turn after they've had their first test. You'd be catching, you'd, you'd know the whole day by day profile and that could help in it sorting out what makes the most sense for duration of, M of MIQ. So I, I'd comment on that, that, you know, I don't know the answer to yeah. that, right? But I, I do know, and even as a, as a non-scientist and having been in a family business for 20 years with a mathematician, yeah. math is important. Yep. And um, you can model all this and, up. And, and, and you can model it all up. Uh, and and the, the, the way, it's interesting. You know, my brother Stephen will not talk about the medical or the epidemiological stuff, but he does come at those problems from a, as a pure mathematician. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a lot of the insights that we needed to establish this business and become successful. And it's that's the thing about science. As long as you're not, you know, he is taking his mathematical ability and starting to tell people, you know, that they should be wearing masks, you know, but he can model, yeah what wearing masks mean. And so I think once you're getting the data, and that's the other thing that's interesting about the University of Illinois, 46,000 people in an island being tested twice a week if you're an undergraduate student, once a week if you're faculty, is that as that population gets vaccinated, we're gonna to start to get the best information about whether or not you can still catch the virus, whether or not you're infectious um, still, whether or not you'll be passing it on, even if you don't get any symptoms at all. Yeah. And so there'll be different vaccinations coming into that population. And it's probably the best, um, uh, you know, uh, data experiment on COVID in the world. Cool. Uh, next quest question: Does your test catch all the mutants? Yes. Uh, Thermo Fisher is our partner uh, in terms of providing us with the assay and the reagent, uh, and have been tremendous support for us um, in establishing um, uh, the operation. And Thermo Fisher's scientists, um, uh, you know, that's the great thing of being plugged into international science is that as soon as those uh, variations came on, they were reviewing their assay to see whether or not the, the three genes that we look for mm -hmm. are still present in the variants. And we had immediate, like within 48 yeah. hours, we had reassurance that uh, we can catch those variants and it doesn't change the accuracy of the test. A question, what's your current strategy in making sure this style of PCR testing becomes a mainstream within MOH and speculation they've been non-receptive, right? I think you covered a bit of that in your recent yeah. chat with MOH. Yeah, well, I think, no, I just think it's about letting the science do the talking and getting a positive um, dialogue going. Yeah. And that started this week uh, when we, um, we uh, launched uh, uh, in the media, our business. Um, we have been testing since mid-January. So, you know, we, we've um, um, uh, opened up with uh, the chief scientist from uh, the Ministry of Health in town. We had Martin Burke, the lead uh, from the University of Illinois. He's an amazing scientist and great communicator. And we had our science team engaging with the ESR scientists and the Ministry of Health of Scientists um, and uh, coming to, a, you know, to grips with just the huge amount of data that the Illinois got and the yep. data that we've done that validates it in a New Zealand environment. And uh, so that's underway. So, so I'm an eternal optimist. So we've talked a little bit about uh, different ways that we could reimagine the border system. I talk a bit with the Otago Public Health guys on similar grounds. It's weird if you told me a year and a half ago that uh, at the start of 2021, I'd be like uh, shoulder to shoulder with the Otago Public Health guys, because usually I'm fighting with them about sugar taxes and stuff like that. But on this one, there's not much daylight between us. We've been talking about systems like uh, pushing some of the MIQ back to the other side, um, people having a stay in a hotel abroad, maybe have a, a small number of departure points to get to New Zealand from, so people would transit in one of those few spots, mm, mm. And then come on to New Zealand after having spent a few days in one of those isolation spots with regular testing there, returning a few positive, a few negative tests before being allowed to board, and then perhaps that giving room for a shorter spell here, if that were able to be proved up. Were you thinking about along similar lines on this? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've, as a, as a business, are very focused um, on aviation um as a as a service yeah 
um, and the the model of how you do that. I mean, I'll leave to the yeah yeah to the to the epidemiologists. And uh, I think one of the things that we decided to do uh, and was we just made the investment in September, started spending quite a lot of money on capital equipment yeah and forming um, high uh, value teams. Is we decided that what was it wasn't until you turn it into a reality, can you change facts on the ground? Cool. I think we've got one final question here, unless anybody comes in late and we're starting to get close to time anyway. But if there are any last questions, send them through. The last one that I've got up here is, will COVID be over once we're all vaccinated or will we still need regular tests like yours to reassure ourselves? Uh, well, Sean Hendy from University of Auckland was saying that uh, the fact that um, uh, uh, the vaccines will stop you from being severely ill or moderately ill. So yeah. you should, we should all have vaccinations. I am a vaccination champion. I think it's fantastic what the government's done in terms of getting the Pfizer vaccine in here and, and the other ones that are coming in because they all look like very good vaccines. Um, but, you know, if you listen to people um, like from the Maligan Institute, they're saying we're going to have to live with the COVID-19 virus. Um, and so I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm, it, it's quite possible that um, like influenza, we're going to end up having a jab that includes a coronavirus jab that goes with it for the variant that that's there and it's sort of you know you, i think you'll be able to protect the population and vaccinate kids when they get at an age where you can vaccinate them so that you know you're preventing serious disease but but i do think though that when you travel if you can carry or catch the virus even though you don't get sick you could give that to another susceptible population that hasn't been vaccinated mm -hmm. and do a lot of damage in a country so I think that um, there's going to be new rules and new systems and new services. And I think, you know, the, I, I, I've been reading the IATA work they're doing on an e-health passport uh, is being a system they're building for a, at least a decade. So that tells you that, you know, yeah. it, they're standing up a system um, that needs to last at least 10 years. That doesn't mean yeah. we'll be in pandemic. You know, it might, it'll mean as New Zealand, you know, we'll... Uh, it doesn't mean that we'll have to have closed borders, um, but it does mean that we're going to probably need to take more precautions to, to protect susceptible populations. Good stuff. Thank you so much, Leon. This has been really exciting. Um, I've been despairing a little bit about the prospects for being able to see my parents again, uh, or heaven forbid there ever be an emergency I need to go back there for. Um, being able to get to regular testing in the quarantine system seems about the only way we've got of letting the government safely scale up the quarantine system so we are able to meet demand both from um, people who weren't born here who were living here and might need to go abroad or Kiwis abroad who need to come home and for re-enabling um, essential worker travel so that folks can get the specialist engineers in that they're not able to get in currently. We regularly hear horror stories from our members about trying to convince MB that their worker is actually really critical. It's a difficult process, but all of that gets easier if we can scale up MIQ. And the only way of doing that is if we can do it safely. Your system is gonna help hopefully make it safer. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you everyone. Uh, join us next time if we have another one of these. Thank you. And end. <laughs>